and he's a social psychologist whose primary research interest is in stereotyping, prejudice, and discrimination. That's a class. Because your mind fills in the gaps. In fact, some of you might even be seeing a different shade here from here. Mm -hmm. It's not there. It's your mind filling it in. And that is what our minds do. Our minds fill in gaps because we're typically presented with incomplete information. And we're often presented with incomplete information about physical objects. And we're always uh, presented with incomplete information about human beings, other people. And we fill in the blanks about people as well. We call that stereotyping and prejudice. It was a highly adaptive thing for our species to do when we lived in simpler times. But now, when we live in a, in a time where we, most of us aspire to egalitarianism, it, it proves to be very harmful. So that's the crux of the social psychological application uh, to uh, policy issues surrounding discrimination. The, the main point I want to give to you uh, about this is that Things like stereotyping, which are you know these overgeneralized beliefs about the attributes of groups, and prejudice, or likes or dislikes for, for other people. These are normal human cognitive processes. But normal is not necessarily desirable. And we have to be able to live with that dichotomy, that it's normal for us to not only fill in gaps, but also to spontaneously categorize things. Not only did we see a triangle, but we knew it was a triangle. We called it a triangle. And, and we also categorize people spontaneously in groups. And sometimes we miscategorize. We miscategorize this set of six objects into two triangles, and sometimes we miscategorize six into Muslims, etc. And that's uh, a problem that yields policy outcomes. Combined with this tendency for us to uh, categorize people very quickly and to attribute characteristics to them that uh, that we believe to be true of their group but are very unlikely to be true of the individual. Combine that with fear and you get a situation that is ripe for discrimination. And we have a long history of that. This predates September 11, 2001. In the United States, we have the Alien and Sedition Acts, the suspension of habeas corpus, the internment of Japanese, uh, the persecution of suspected communists. It, it, it's something that occurs and it occurs every time there's a conflict. And every time there is elevated fear in the, in the population. So the stereotypes I was talking about, that's the cognitive thought part of our biases. And the fear and the anger and the contempt and the distrust. 
distrust and sometimes the pride, sometimes the positive emotion, these psychological mechanisms give rise to discrimination. I want to just briefly uh, tell a story about my favorite topic, which is my 10-year-old son, um, because it's, it's quite illustrative of what we're talking about. I was telling him why I had to go to New York, and, uh, and we were talking about this conference, and I explained the whole issue to him. And he was really struggling with it, very thoughtful little guy. And he, uh, he said uh, he just couldn't get past the idea that it just makes sense for, the, you know, for airport screeners to make people take their turns off. He couldn't get beyond it because he said that would make people safer. And we didn't get into all the nuances of the rationality of that and you know, the, the double standard implied in that and the like. But he couldn't get beyond that. And then he actually said, I know it's not fair, but my thoughts are warped by fear. OK, to be honest, he was quoting Harry Potter. Um, <laughs> but he really he drew on that quote because it meant something to him. And it captured his feelings. And it captures a lot of people's feelings. Because when we are experiencing fear, our, our minds tend to revert down to the lizard brain part. And we make snap decisions, and we make poor decisions, and we err on the side of safety, and, or what we perceive to be safety, and we sacrifice liberty for that. And in that vein, I just want to finish with some quotes from some uh, great Americans who I, they, they have stated this point so much more eloquently than I, than I could. So I'm just going to end in reverse chronological order um, by quoting Thurgood Marshall, uh, who was an African-American who rose to the highest level of the American judiciary, judiciary and was one of the most distinguished members of the Supreme Court, uh, who said, history teaches us that grave threats, threats to liberty often come in times of urgency when constitutional rights seem too extravagant to endure. And another oppressed member of an oppressed minority group, Louis Brandeis, a Jew, who also rose to the Supreme Court, said in 1928, the greatest dangers to liberty lurk in insidious encroachment by men of zeal, well-meaning but without understanding. And then finally, I'd like to close with a statement uh, that Benjamin Franklin, one of our founding fathers, stated uh, in the 18th century. And I couldn't get the exact quote, so I'm going to paraphrase, paraphrase, but he essentially said, those who are willing to sacrifice liberty for the sake of safety deserve neither. And I'll, I'll end on that. Thank you very much, all of you. This was really great. Um, we have, you know, five minutes for question and answer, and I see a hand raised. Yeah, just two quick comments, really. One to Julius in terms of, I think the issue in terms of multiculturalism, uh, it's there in terms of Canada and Great Britain and UK. There are some issues with the bar. I think the problem we're having in France and other places in Europe is this issue of integration versus assimilation. Now, integration is fine, but when you come to assimilation, it's actually asking minorities to actually assimilate in the mainstream culture. And I think that's where the challenge is. Because integration, I don't think the Sikh community has got any problems with integration, because integration for me is about two things. It's about participation and participating in society. And it's about interacting with others. And I don't think have a problem in terms of interacting with others. So I think there's real push in terms of France hiding behind integration, but in reality it's about assimilation. So I'd like to comment on that. And lastly, in terms of uh, Matt, I, I think when I talk about secularism, I think plural secularism is fine. But pluralism is about each faith or religion having the space in the public, but no one dominant over the other. But the fear factor is a secularism issue. And in reality, a lot of states that say they're plural, there is still that dominant aspect. For example, if you, even the UK, where you've actually got bishops sitting in the House of Lords, so therefore Christianity is the dominant faith. And all due respect to Christianity, I think in the USA, actually you have the president that swears an oath on the Bible. You know, does that send a message in terms of actually is it about treating everybody equal, or is it that there's one faith dominant over the other? So I think the issue is there in terms of there is that threat of secularism from the fact that there is that public space. And I think from France's point of view, I think the challenge for the Sikhs is to actually say it's not about integration. We're willing to integrate. My the start, my turban, my five case, that doesn't stop me from <coughs> participating in society. That doesn't stop me from interacting with others. So what's the problem in terms of integration? Well, the first point I'd say about integration is yes, integration does not mean disappearance. 
Integration means participation. Integration means identifying with the society so that everybody sees you as an integral part of the society. Uh, let me give you an obvious thing. If today, it wasn't always so. Uh, if somebody who is running for office in France is a Breton, nobody's going to even think for a moment that he's not uh, truly French. Uh, the question, it's, it's on both sides. It has to be a trust and everything else. There's one thorny issue in integration, and I think it has to be answered in favor of integration. And that one is the one of mixed marriage. I think in any society, if there are groups that do not marry each other, but there is no, not coming and going both ways, uh, in the end, it ends badly. And that's one of the difficult issues, that's one of the diff issues that the Jewish minority has always had tremendous difficulty with, but I think that's settled in the United States or in France or in Britain right now. There's no problem about that. And I think that's one of the things. But I fully agree with you. Integration is not assimilation. The worst example of assimilation is the Tsar, who wanted basically, he said the Poles should just become Russians. And that's no way to, to, to deal with any uh, minority. Uh, integration means both sides contributing to a new society. But the way to, to perhaps portray this is this. What are the two types of societies that occasionally persecute uh, or, or behave in a way which is unacceptable in religion? There are two very different types. One is a very religious society, which has one religion which dominates. Iran is a beautiful example of that, where they can't take the Baha'i because they've got one religion, and in the name of that one religion, that's what might happen in Egypt if the fundamentalists win, may not. The other type of society is a society with a militant uh, uh, secularism, which turns anti-religious. Secularism is not intended to be anti-religious. It's intended to give everybody his absolute freedom to choose or not choose any religion, any part of any religion, or anything they want. So the two types that ultimately become very similar in doing bad things are either the ultra-religious state, which has one religion, which is stuffing down people's throats, and the ultra-secular state, which says, I don't tolerate religion. Religion is just private. Don't show it to me. Hide it. That's wrong. And the two, therefore, seeming opposites are the enemies of <coughs> celebration, tolerance, having everybody remain and work together. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have room for one more question. Thanks to Prindus and Cass. So they came in. Uh, Mr. Blaster, um, all of yours, uh, George Lekhoff, also talks about something similar to what you're talking about. Um, obviously, the Sikhs have kind of felt labeled just that. I mean, there's the correlation between terrorist turban uh, in India, and every time they bring that on time and time again to portray that as an image. Um, I, I know different societies use it, but how has the state has learned to do that, in particular in our case? How has the state learned to the state hate the turban with terrorism? How, how has the state has pushed us into such a corner that that's what people have learned to call it? And that was big, been the biggest battle for us outside and, and because that's the label they put on us and that's a hard one to get off. Yeah. And, and that's, that's what I mean by state terrorism. Well, I, I think that part, is this working? Part of, um, part of this question was answered earlier when there was discussion of um, the, uh, the bureaucracy, well, I don't know that this came up specifically, but the way these, the way these things happen bureaucratically, um, whether it's a state, deliberate state action or deliberate state machination to uh, put these people into this box is unclear, I think. My personal perspective as somebody who's written and studied the, the, the uh, airport profiling issue is that it's often a bottom-up uh, problem where it's the agents uh, who are carrying out the act and when you talk to the people running the show um, they say it's not acceptable it's not legitimate it's not valid um, to use these kinds of indicators now I'm talking about the United States because clearly in France there's a different orientation um, and the Transit Safety Administration's policy in the US the official policy 
now is to uh, not require anybody to take off a, a, a religious headdress. But, um, but that somehow doesn't always trickle down to the agents on the ground who um, are tasked with something very different. And their mental orientation is a, a safety orientation, and they're trying to prevent a negative outcome, and they're not thinking about promoting positive outcomes. And so it's a, it, I, you know, this is my bias, but I think it's a deeply psychological phenomenon. And I don't, and I'm not claiming to know one way or the other, but I don't attribute it to a federal level um, motive. I think it's more of an individual level error. Um, but it's something that the, where motivation comes in is, it's, and th this is something, this is a new orientation in the law, in the US law, to think about um, how people come to discriminate. And one of the big breakthroughs, not in the law yet, but in the science, is that most of our stereotypes and prejudice operate outside of conscious awareness and intent. They happen without our, our ability to control them. In fact, they are uncontrollable most of the time. And so that leads to unintentional discrimination. And then the burden with regard to intent has to shift from, uh, you know, the, the current intent doctrine says, if a person is proven to have intended to discriminate, then they are culpable. The burden is going to need to shift, especially with administrative agencies that are depriving people of basic rights on a daily basis. The burden needs to shift to an intent to not discriminate. So just to clarify, the current burden in the courts is, <coughs> was there an intent to discriminate? To actually eliminate discrimination, you have to move to an intent to not discriminate. An affirmative action, to borrow a phrase, to not discriminate. Thank you. Can we have uh, a very nice question? question. Uh, sorry? A really quick question. Or, uh, it's not quick, I'm online. But can we have one more? Uh, you know, we are running late. Do you think it's really pressing? Or can you have a private discussion? Because if you're you know, really pressing, we can. We can okay, uh, thank you. So um, I could guess we would like to uh, end this and move on to the next. Can we get some talk and, and uh, also the Pindos thing to present the Awards for our great uh, panel up here. For Mr. Julius Gray. They're both directors on the United States uh, and colleagues of ours, of course. Uh, Matt Cherry. <laughs> Jack Glasser. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.